This is Radio Equal Shock with your host, Alex Smith. Several scientists on Radio EcoShock warned us that heat and extreme weather are serious. They can be deadly, but rising seas will be the force threatening society. Maps will change. Populations will be forced away from the current seashore, including in major cities around the world. I understood that more deeply watching a recent video presentation by John Englander. His audience was the legendary Royal Institution in London, the Temple of Science, founded in 1799. Englander is the oceanographer who has led big-name ocean conservation groups. He schooled us all with his book, High Tide on Main Street, Rising Sea Level, and the Coming Coastal Crisis. We last talked in October 2016. John Englander, welcome back to Radio EcoShock. It's great to be with you, Alex. You have been touring, telling thousands of people, really, about coastlines going underwater, Do you think the broader public really gets it, what a relentless rising sea means for us all? Um, A little better than perhaps when we talked, but no. I think that most people are confused. They've heard lots of bad information, and frankly, uh, our time horizons as a human civilization is pretty short. I notice a growing awareness, but I would have to say it's still down there in the single-digit percentages. Okay, well, here's the constant question I'll bet you're always asked. How much will sea level rise and when? John, do we have good answers? Yeah, that is probably the most common question, so you're absolutely right. We don't have a good answer, but the reason is surprising, and it's that we have potentially 200 feet of sea level rise of all the ice melted on Antarctica and Greenland. That's not going to happen for centuries, maybe 500 years, maybe thousands of years. The question is, how much could melt? by the year 2050 or the year 2100. And there's no definitive answer because it's like predicting when the next San Francisco earthquake will happen or when the next mudslide will happen or the next avalanche. Those kind of shifts of earth mass or mud or glaciers are not predictable to the normal standard. It's like saying, when will the next Category 5 hurricane happen? We can't even predict that months in advance. And with sea level... It's usually a slow change. It's usually over centuries or thousands of years, actually, as the ice sheets change. What's happening now is happening in in warp speed. It's happening very quickly. And so when we get to the question of how much could sea level rise in the next year, the truth is it's a fraction of an inch. But because of the accelerating melt of the glaciers and ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica, the two places that hold 98% of the ice on the planet and therefore potential sea level rise, The fact is, by the end of the century, we could be looking at 5 or 10 feet of sea level rise. We can't know the answer more precisely any more than somebody could tell you when the next major earthquake will happen in San Francisco. It seems surprising. It may seem like, well, we just don't know enough. But the truth is, those big shifts of Earth and those big shifts of ice miles deep or high do not model to the normal precision that we would like to have. No matter how much you know about this subject, and I think I know as much as most, Plan for the first three feet of sea level rise as soon as possible. And that simple guideline actually is very helpful. If it happens by 2060, we'll be prepared. If it doesn't happen until 2100, we have a little extra time. Yeah, I think that uncertainty is why groups like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and some governments just discount rising seas because, well, if you can't give me a hard answer, how am I supposed to plan for that? That's right. But, you know, we do it with, uh, that's why I like to use the analogies, which we normally don't do in science because they're never perfect. But the analogy of predicting the next earthquake, the next avalanche in the mountains, or the next mudslide, you know, in an area that was prone to it, we accept our inability to predict those things. And yet, we plan for the worst case. We plan for the worst hurricane. We plan for a Category 8 earthquake. You know, San Francisco is a great example. We know from the 1906 earthquake that the fault lines go right through the city pretty much. But the planning, what they do right now is, even with all the strain gauges monitoring the fault lines, they plan on a Category 8 earthquake within 50 years having a 10% chance of probability. But we design for that worst case now, and we need to start doing the same thing for sea level rise because it will be feet higher. We just don't know how soon. Experts report unstoppable melting of some glaciers in both Greenland and Antarctica. Is that the main source of rising seas, or or what about thermal expansion? 
Well, in the last century, this is why it gets confusing, thermal expansion, just warming seawater, which is more than two miles deep as a global average, that has been about half the sea level rise in the last century, about four or five inches. And so that leads people to think that that's a major cause. And again, it was significant in the last century. But moving ahead, because of the glaciers that we're now tracking in Greenland and Antarctica, as you mentioned, which hold many, many feet of sea level rise. I mean, it's easy to find 10 feet of sea level rise in just six glaciers in Antarctica, so three meters. And sometime this century, we're going to have more than a meter of sea level rise. So the thermal expansion was significant looking back the last century, but in the coming 100 years, it will be relatively minor stuff compared to the melting of those glaciers. People I talk to about this just on the street, they think sea level rise will hit Bangladesh or the Pacific Islands maybe, but it it won't be a big deal for people in North America or Europe or even Australia because we can always deal with it. What do you say? Yeah, I don't know what the psychological thing is we all do, but we tend to say we're immune. You know, it's kind of like getting older. You know, I'm not going to get older. Everybody else does. And the fact is sea level rise is going to hit every coastal community in the world. So when they say it's a Miami problem or a New York City problem because they're thinking of the storm, you know, Hurricane Sandy, I like to say it's it's not only Bangladesh and Vietnam, it's San Francisco Bay, it's Boston, it's Jacksonville, Florida, and Tampa, not just Miami. It's 10,000 coastal communities. In fact, it's essentially every community that touches the ocean not just on the coast, but up tidal rivers, so like Washington, D.C., London, England, and Sacramento, or none of them are on the ocean, but they're all on tidal rivers, and those will flood, and then up through marshlands like Louisiana and Mississippi and up through the Carolinas. All those marshes will be affected as sea level rises foot by foot. So, yes, people tend to think it's a Miami and New York problem, but 10,000 coastal communities would be more accurate. Well, of course, you could be in the interior of the United States or or of China and say, well, it's not going to affect me. But look, if these big coastal cities have to be replaced with all their infrastructure, the economic damage, we've got 50 percent of the population of the United States lives within a few miles of the coastlines. Everybody's going to be hit by this as it happens, I think. Absolutely true. And on top of that, even if you live a thousand miles inland and a and mile high like Geneva or Denver, your goods still come through ports. And if the ports have been put underwater and the global supply chain is interrupted, anybody that thinks they're, they're, they're unaffected by, by rising sea level you know, hasn't looked at the globe recently. Most of our goods come by ship. And the functionality of, of not only the ports but the infrastructure, the, the highways and the railroads that all terminate at ports, you know, are, bring this issue to every community on Earth. So there is an institute for practically everything, but apparently none yet dedicated to the single largest threat we face from climate change, the rising seas. So you, John, just founded the International Sea Level Institute. What should it do? Well, thank you for asking, and thank you for being aware. Actually, uh, last week I was in Puerto Rico talking to them about a a regional office for this to help them put this into uh, uh, practical terms for how they should begin adapting. And next week I'll be in London, England, actually up in the Midlands for their annual Coast and Flooding Conference, talking to them about the same thing. So communities are starting to ask, and that's what our institute is, is doing to bring this to people in exactly the kind of questions you're asking, Alex, the, the practical issues and breaking down the kind of confusing science, because we do need to plan for rising waters. In fact, I like to put it into a positive that, you know, we must rise with the tide. Uh, king tides, these extreme high tides that are driven by the position of the planets, they're getting higher and higher. The reason they're getting higher is because there's more water in the ocean, and that's because the glaciers are melting in Greenland and Antarctica. So we, we're not seeing the big picture, and we need to, and that's a good function for a nonprofit. So that's uh, what our International Sea Level Institute will do. And uh, we have a, a basic website. We're still in the process of development, but it's sealevelinstitute.org. Sealevelinstitute.org. Okay, I will check that out. Now, you have been telling people that sea level rise may be the least politically charged impact of climate change. Uh, People who don't seem to care about heat or even replacing fossil fuels do pay attention to rising seas. Talk to us about that, John. 
Yes, when I started focusing on this problem back in 2007, I think it was, when I really got focused on the sea level, it was because I realized that as sea level went higher and higher and moved the shoreline inland and put property underwater and investments, that that was a message that was nonpartisan. And I could stay out of the political fray, and it didn't matter whether I was on the right or left, that the fact is, no matter what somebody's wealth they might care about the shoreline moving inland. And I put it in that, those simple terms. And it's been quite effective, uh, to a degree, by getting it out of the politics and not being associated with the right, left, or even center, and just saying, here are the facts. Because whether you're a very conservative or even libertarian investor, or whether you're a politician on, on the right side, or a banker, or somebody who just is watching their stocks and, and uh, you know, where the markets are headed, the idea that sea level will rise foot by foot, and actually has already passed the point of stopping any time this century, tends to get people's attention and be seen as outside of politics. It also appeals to the national security interests and military leaders, and uh, I just try and stay clear of any partisan politics. Yeah, I guess the biggest naval port in the world at Norfolk, Virginia, could well go under. And and I have talked to people who have assessed military awareness of this, and it's high. They know it's coming. Absolutely. The naval station Norfolk, as you say, is not only the world's largest Navy base, but has had for 10 or 20 years now has had problems with the piers becoming dysfunctional at king tides, let alone storm events. And uh, they spent tens of millions, I bet it's well over $100 million already, grappling with the problem and studying how are they going to deal with this as it gets worse and worse. And it's not just the Navy, it's the Coast Guard. In fact, the Air Force, a lot of of, uh, airports and and, uh, Air Force bases are near the water for safety reasons to not being overpopulations as they uh, take off and and land. And uh, they're all having a problem with more and more flooding. In your presentation to the Royal Institution, you said when the oceans warm, they release carbon dioxide. Now, we've been used to the ocean being a big carbon sink that soaks up our excess pollution, but this sounds like more bad news. How would that work? It's interesting. The oceans, or the atmosphere carbon level and the ocean temperature, go together over long periods of time. There's two different principles of physics, and it's one of the confusing things, but they move in lockstep with a bit of a delay. When the oceans warm, there's a principle of physics that says the amount of dissolved gas will be less. And you can prove this very simply. Take two bottles of carbonated beverage, club soda or, or Coke, doesn't matter, and uncap them. And if you warm one, it will go flat. It will have less carbonated dissolved gas than the one that's cool still. And so that's the proof that warmer liquids release gas. And you can actually watch it happen. The converse, that the carbon dioxide in the air will warm the ocean, is this principle of greenhouse gases that was proven in 1859 at the Royal Institution at that same lecture desk that that you saw me at in that video. And it's a simple physics principle that's been known for 170 years that carbon dioxide, even though it's clear, traps heat in a very powerful way. So If we put more carbon dioxide in the air, it traps heat and warms the ocean. And if geothermal or or orbital uh, variations of temperature warm the ocean, which is what's happened historically, it will release carbon dioxide. So for two totally different principles of physics, carbon dioxide and temperature will go together over the course of decades and centuries. In recent interviews, scientists and authors say we may warm another 2 degrees C average mean temperature by the year 2100, taking us up to 3 degrees C warmer than pre-industrial. Now, if I understood what you said in your lecture correctly, that science expects 20 meters higher seas for each increase of 1 degree, and hey, that would be 40 meters or 131 feet higher seas from that much warming. Surely that cannot possibly happen by 2100. When would the full impact be reached? Oh, you know, it would be centuries, undoubtedly, and, and perhaps even some would say thousands of years. So to make this realistic and practical, even though the numbers you said are theoretically correct, I like to point out that and in that science environment of the Royal Institution, I was a little more specific than normal. But there is a relationship of sea level to global temperature of 20 meters per degree C, which works out to about 35 feet per degree Fahrenheit. So even though we have already warmed almost a degree C, which would be 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to take centuries 
to get, you know, anything like that amount of sea rise. So let's stay focused on this century and back to where we were, that we could be looking at one to three meters, two and a half meters of sea level rise this century on our current path. So that's, uh, you know, that's between three and eight feet. And even though that's a range of uncertainty, like preparing for hurricanes or earthquakes in San Francisco or mudslides or avalanches, we should begin preparing for somewhere between three and eight feet of sea level rise. And that's an entirely revolutionary concept in coastal development and architecture and engineering and ports and so on. And the sooner we plan for it cautiously or conservatively, the better. Big Picture Radio right now with Alex Smith. Get it all, ecoshock.org. You are listening to Radio EcoShock. I'm your host, Alex Smith. Our guest is oceanographer, author, and longtime protector of the seas, John Englander. And you can find him at johnenglander.net. We're talking about the single biggest impact of climate change, rising seas. All right, so John, when it comes to flooding of major cities like New York, London, or Shanghai, can we build our way out of it? How are the sea defenses on the Thames River or at Rotterdam working out? The defenses on the Thames and in Rotterdam were not built high enough. In both cases, they were designed after the storm of 1953 that uh, killed a few thousand people. Nobody imagined sea level being 10 feet higher, you know, in the next century or two. So they were designed for a much lower threshold. They were mostly designed for storms. Uh, to your broader question, that from Shanghai to Calcutta and Copenhagen to uh, Manila, you know, what should we be designing to in these thousands of coastal cities? In some places, we can build seawalls to a degree, but that's not an endless solution. You can't build a 20-foot seawall, and even in places like Miami, which have porous limestone, most places that are built on ancient coral reefs, seawalls wouldn't work at all because the water would just come up deep underground through the porous rock. So different cities will have different solutions. In some places, we can have levees. some places we can have those big engineering solutions like Rotterdam and London, as you mentioned, but they need to be evaluated both for the rock structure, the elevation of the land. If the land is very flat, it's only three feet high, the options are limited. If the land rises more steeply and it's solid rock, there's other options. But each case needs to have a vulnerability assessment and a design that's appropriate. But the the simple thought that we're just going to build higher and higher seawalls is misplaced. We are at some point when we face five or ten feet of sea level rise, we are going to have to, as I say, move to higher ground, both uh, literally and figuratively. Uh, that may mean higher buildings, elevated. It could be floating buildings, it, or it literally could be moving inland to to a higher point. But we're not going to give up the coast. We will always need to be on the coast for shipping and fishing and recreation and beauty and everything. I don't believe as a species that we could ever just live, you know, 10 miles inland. We will always need to be on the coast for practical reasons of uh, working with the ocean for fisheries and shipping. I remember a few years ago talking with the Maryland professor, Jay Court Stevenson. It was after Sandy, and he said that for about $10 billion, they could build floodgates to protect the port of New York at least until the year 2100. It's a matter of finding the social will and the political awareness to do it, because really New York hasn't done that. They haven't started that, even though they know it could happen, even though lower Manhattan was flooded during Sandy. Well, that's true, and they are marshalling plans to do that and and looking at funding sources and designs. Uh, But we have to distinguish that base higher sea level, let's just think of even three feet higher sea level, is one situation, and that's a permanent rise in water height and therefore trying to push the shoreline inland. On top of that, we get storms and extreme tides. A lot of the solutions are really storm barriers to keep out, you know, the walls of water during a Hurricane Sandy or Katrina-type event, and that's valid. But those solutions are probably not solutions to sea level being three feet higher permanently. So we need to think of both. And, we, we, you know, like... Even, in, unfortunately, in, in, in warfare and national security, we tend to be fighting the last battle, as the generals say. And designing something for Hurricane Sandy or Hurricane Katrina is valid, but it's not the same thing as preparing for sea level normally 
on a sustained basis being several feet higher. Because when it is higher, it means when the big storm does come to town, even it will be higher. So there's two different situations. There's sustained sea level and then temporary flooding during an event. We have to prepare for both. John Englander, are you finding governments in Asia are interested in rising seas and adaptation? Yes. I think, uh, although I haven't been there in a few years, I do know that China is asking the question, and, and Singapore, for example, and even in Japan, they're becoming more aware of this. I think um, of all the countries, and, and perhaps it's easiest and most vulnerable because they're a small island nation, Singapore is perhaps ahead, but... Um, I think the advantage that all the Asian cultures have, so China, uh, Japan, Singapore, Korea, is they think longer. They, they, you know, they can plan for a century quite naturally because they look back thousands of years in their culture. In the West, particularly in the United States, we think um, three months, a <laughs> quarterly report, is a long time. And to begin to plan for a century from now is much harder for us. Uh, I do sense that uh, Asia has that historical time perspective and uh, probably will be ahead of us. In fact, there's, there are signs of that. If we need a reference city for incursion by the sea, you recommend an odd choice, San Francisco. How come? Well, San Francisco is, a, is a, not only a great American city, it tends to be our gateway to the Pacific and Asian cultures for a number of reasons. So it's a very... Uh, a heterogeneous city culturally, but also it tends to be the city that uh, is the city that has our oldest tide gauges. We have very good historic record of sea level change in San Francisco, and it's not moving up or down. We call vertical land movement like New Orleans or Norfolk are both going down. The, the land is literally going down, so sea level rise happens faster there. In Alaska, the land is moving upwards, so sea level seems to be falling there. San Francisco, therefore, has a lot of characters I really like. It's a, it's a very ethnically diverse city, a very vibrant city the, you know, near Silicon Valley. But the giant San Francisco Bay is having problems with flooding and what they call sea level rise. It's not ocean waves so much because the Golden Gate Bridge kind of throttles or stops the big ocean waves from coming in, into the giant bay. But they are seeing right there on the Embarcadero, the 140-year-old elevation was set 140 years ago, that long seven-and-a-half-mile waterfront that many visitors have been to, that's flooding more and more. It's very visual. The, water, the waves are coming up over the seawall, and it's because sea level rise is manifesting during these king tide events, and it's happening now about 30 days a year. So being a very iconic U.S. city, it's a great place to see the vulnerability and get away from this uh, you know, belief that, oh, this is just a natural cycle and uh, this isn't a problem, because in the last 10, 20, 30 years, it's become increasingly visible there. The problem of cities really holds people's attention. So many people live in cities, but we hear less about saltwater incursion into deltas that are heavily populated and farmed. And I think that's going to make the news as millions of people become migrants, or maybe it won't hit the news because it'll happen slowly and farmers just leave their salted fields as they're doing right now in Vietnam. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's saltwater incursion or intrusion, it's, it's often said, and that's where the saltwater is getting into the aquifers and the, the place we, we use for fresh water for drinking water, like here in South Florida, but for agriculture as well in, in coastal areas. So you're absolutely right. Um, it is already having effect. Uh, you can see it in, in these stranded forests, and, and I think it is going to have a big effect. And it's, just, it's hard to keep our eyes on it because it gets lost in the storms and the changing rainfall patterns, which could be droughts or heavier rain, both of which happen with a warming ocean, by the way. So it's confusing, but I think it will have a dramatic effect not only on agriculture, but also on drinking water supply as the glaciers melt and recede from the Sierra Nevadas to uh, Asia, Himalayas, and even to South America, uh, to Argentina, that those shrinking glaciers are going to also affect agriculture, just as will rising salt water getting into the water table, as you described. Okay, suppose we miraculously manage to slash greenhouse gas emissions in the next 10 or 20 years and the renewable energy revolution finally takes off with electric everything. Will the sea stop rising when our emissions stop happening? 
No, unfortunately, it will take decades, in fact, centuries, for sea level rise to stop and for even the possibility of reversing it. It will slow, and we need to, to do everything you just described, which is to slow the emissions and even find ways to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to slow the warming, to slow the melting ice, to slow the rising sea. That's the first step. It's like if you're speeding down the road and can see you're going to hit the wall on a wet pavement, the first thing is take your foot off the accelerator. And so that's the equivalent. We have to reduce the warming input. But we're not going to immediately stop the car nor stop a super tanker in its tracks when you pull back on the throttle. So we have to do both. We have to pull back on the warming force that's melting the ice and raising the sea level. But we also have to recognize, as you just suggested, that it, it won't stop immediately. In fact, it will be decades, in fact, perhaps centuries, before sea level rise stops because we've warmed the oceans already one degree Celsius almost two degrees Fahrenheit, and we're on target to double that or triple that now. And that warming is going to translate into smaller glaciers and ice sheets, which means higher sea level, which means the shoreline is going to tend to move inland. So we've got to do both. Slow the warming, begin preparing for strange weather events, extreme weather events, heavy rainfall, droughts, fires, and also for higher sea level that can't be stopped in its tracks. John, you tell audiences rising sea level could be the biggest economic driver for this century. I'm a little bit more pessimistic. I'm wondering whether we will be able to rebuild or adapt rather than just lose ground or run away or even crash as an economy. Uh, how could it be a good thing in a way if if we get our act together? Well, great question. I don't think you're wrong, Alex, I must tell you. But, you know, to move forward, we have to see light at the end of the tunnel. We have to see the glass half full as well as half empty. And, and I, I'm always clear to say that, but there is truth in it. If we think about the fact that sea level is going to be five feet higher, whether it happens by 2060 or 2160, but at some point, as soon as that becomes clear, and it becomes clear we can't stop it, even though we, we must try and slow it, we are going to have to build or engineer a new coastal communities and ports and everything all over the world. And at the simplest level, if you think about it, let's just say that, that sea level is you know, headed five feet higher and we've got a century's notice. Once that becomes clear, and whether it be Bangladesh and Vietnam or New York City or Miami or Tampa or Jacksonville, um, Copenhagen, cities we don't normally think of, we are going to spend trillions of dollars adapting or relocating or re-engineering on all sorts of things. And it's not optional. I mean, most things in this world we have some choice in. Because we've already warmed the oceans and melting the ice sheets and glaciers, which will raise sea level, the truth is we are going to have to spend trillions of dollars adapting to that, both as either defenses or relocations or engineering marvels of, of raising things up. Whatever it is, that driving force of the melting ice on Greenland and Antarctica raising sea level foot by foot will cause us to spend trillions of dollars. Now, we'll lose trillions of dollars to the sea, but from a simple financial concept on a balance sheet, if you would, take it very simply as, a, as an investor would or a bank or even a country, we may write off a trillion dollars to flooded properties but we're going to spend that much to create new value because this isn't going to kill people, generally speaking. And because it happens slowly enough, we will adapt. But we have no choice. If the ocean is going to be three feet higher, it's not like we have an option as to whether to, uh, to deal with it or not. It's going to become the one inescapable truth that as sea level is five feet higher or headed there, we are going to have to re-engineer every coastal community in the world and up tidal rivers and through the marshlands, and et, et cetera. It's seeing the glass half full. It's saying, as terrible as this will be, there's an upside, and those that can see it early will not only profit, but will help us all adapt. And I see that as a positive. Are you planning another book to follow up on High Tide on Main Street? You're kind to ask. I'm halfway through writing Moving to Higher Ground, it's the sequel, and it talks about some of the things we've just covered in this program. It should be out in 2020. If people sign up on my website, johnenglander.net, they'll, they'll certainly get notice of it. Uh, hopefully, it'll be an even bigger success. High Tide on Main Street did well. But, yes, thank you for asking, and I'm excited. And it really will cover a lot of the direction that you've, uh, 
you thoughtfully asked me on this program on EcoShock. We have been speaking with John Englander, an oceanographer, longtime leader of several key ocean conservation organizations, and now founder of the International Sea Level Institute. You can find more links to John's work in my show blog at ecoshock.org, and of course, as he says, at his website, johnenglander.net. Thank you so much for taking your time to spread this important message with us. Well, thank you, Alex. You're, you're a great participant in this. You, you're very educated, and you, you're a good interviewer. So thank you for your uh, diligence and staying on top of these issues and bringing them to the public. I'm Alex Smith reporting. 